Okay, so um, some of you may have seen some, uh, some buzz about EA over the last few days. So really delighted to invite Rich Hillman um, from EA. He is the uh, chief creative director, but he's also the co-creator of John Madden. Um, not the guy, the game. So he is responsible for me not meeting girls for about five years. So, um, Rich. Good afternoon. So one of my standard openings is always to get up in front of usually groups of people and say, all of you who have children who play video games, it's all my fault. <laughs> but, but over the last couple of weeks, I've got a new version of that, which is, hi, my name is Richard, Richard Hilleman, and according to all of you, I work for the worst company in the world. <laughs> I'll do my best to live up to that. <laughs> So uh, let's see here. What I thought I'd do is uh, I, I got about 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk for about five minutes about what's going on in our business today. And then I'm going to have squeeze in the middle a little bit of English literature, which I know is why you're all here, right? And then at the end, we're going to talk about what those things have in common. Um, so the first of those things has to do with our business. Um, uh, I've been at Electronic Arts for almost 30 years, which is longer than many of the people in this room have been alive, and so um, it gives me kind of an odd perspective of time. Uh, you know, when I first entered our business, we had pretty much independent developers making all of our products, a disproportionate number living in their parents' houses. Um, and our average development cost in that era, I would say for the first two years we existed, was something on the order of $25,000 for a product. It took about eight months to make, and it usually was made by one guy. Um, and I do mean guy. Uh, in most cases, uh, those products were marketed for about the same amount of money. And when we sold 100,000 units, it was a happy day. Um, in the late 90s to the mid-2000s, um, we went through an era where production values really s skyrocketed, and there were a number of reasons for that. One, some of it was the consoles were capable of expressing that, and so were the PCs. We could aggregate those two things into a big enough business to really spend some money on the production values. And so the kind of creme de la creme console titles that you saw from that era were really driven by um, those economic mechanisms. Um, the world has really changed. Uh, first of all, there aren't just a few platforms anymore. Um, I was describing that our, our platform review process was figuring out if Sony, Microsoft, or Nintendo had shipped anything new that year, and if they didn't, we'd meet the next year. Um, nowadays, I will see a new platform no less than once a week, and I have had weeks where it has been every day, where somebody walks through my door and is trying to express a platform they'd like to see games on, which is it's, it's nice to be liked, but how the heck do I figure that out? Um, so we're going through that process. Um, the biggest thing that's really changed in our business since those mid-2000s has to do with really three things. It's where our customers play games, it's who those people are, and it's how they pay for them. Um, beforehand, we had pretty much what you would describe as a core demographic that played our games. There were about 50 million of those people. They look somewhat like this crowd, although a little younger sometimes, but you'd be surprised. Most console players are actually over 30 on average. So we have a pretty high population of that style of player, but they were disproportionately from a few countries and disproportionately male. Um, that is no longer true. The fastest growing segments of the gaming business are mobile, social, and web, and all three of those formats are dominated by women as customers. It's a completely different world. The second thing is where they play has changed. So we have a very large mobile publishing unit. I think it's the largest in the world for the kind of games that we make. Um, first of all, uh, those of you who play games in the bathroom, we know who you are. <laughs> and as long as you wash your hands, we don't care. <clears throat> um, that's really one of the big changes, is people are not sitting in their living room on a couch playing a video game for two hours at, at a slug. That, that just doesn't happen with this new audience. And that doesn't even speak to the social gaming dynamic of essentially a very high granularity and high frequency of gameplay with very small segments. So this world has really changed in some big ways. Finally, how we get paid. We had really one traditional business model 
we got paid something like $60 for a product. Some of that money went to retail, some of that money went to the platform owner, and then we got to keep some, usually. Um, that model has really changed. The fastest growing payment systems and models within the fastest growing platforms, web, social, mobile, are all free to play or premium or freemium models, which is models where people pay on the way out the door, not on the way in. These are, so what I've just described is kind of three fundamental pillars of our business have shifted in the last five years. Um, so let me talk a little bit about something else we've learned. Now, you ready for the English lit literature lesson, ready? So um, a few years ago, I actually attempted to retire. And during my retirement, I got involved in odd projects. And the, those of you who are Catholic, I'm sorry, no insult intended, but the Catholic Church had never created a patron saint for smart asses. <laughs> and I thought this was a real problem. So I, me and my friend Terry spent a little bit of time trying to figure out what the solution to that problem. And we came down to two final candidates. So the first one of those was Groucho Marx, 80 years. It's just hard to argue with 80 years, and really a high-quality 80 years. You know, it's, it's basically W.C. Fields times four. He just has such a long career at such a great level. The problem was there was one other contender who did come in second place, Groucho won, but the other contender was important, and it's Oscar Wilde. And Oscar's important because he said, to my mind, the single greatest smart-ass comment of all times, which is, if this is how the queen treats her prisoners, she doesn't deserve to have any. Now, when you recognize she could cut his head off at her whim, that's a hell of a thing to say. So uh, I give Oscar a lot of credit. Oscar is about as cynical a person as ever walked the face of the earth, but he wrote some truly beautiful stories. So anybody know what the selfish giant is? Some of you know? Um, I think that's, this is an important origin story for a part of our business today, so I want to share a little of it with you. The context behind this story is there's a giant who owns a large house with a big garden. And it's a beautiful garden. <clears throat> but the giant decides to go away and visit his troll. And so after seven years, they've kind of said as much as a troll and a giant can say to each other. And the giant comes home and discovers that the children have taken over his garden. So he chases them all out and erects a huge wall. Well, what happens is that winter comes and then spring comes, except it doesn't come in the garden. And then winter comes again, and spring and summer, and all the other seasons come, and it never comes in the garden. Well, one day he wakes up and discovers that spring has actually sprung in one corner, and it's because a child had snuck into, the, into his garden. Go read the rest of the story, and you'll find out what happens. But what the underlying context here is that I think this is the origin story of the walled garden. And deep buried within that story is how it's going to come out, too. Uh, generally, the open systems, the parts that unify the rest of the world, are the parts that actually matter. You can only keep the world out so long, whether time or you know the frailties of man will find their ways in. Um, what I think is going on right now is people are trying to erect a bunch of walled gardens. And then there are the wide areas in between. And there are people like you guys, and usually our friends at Google too, who are really devoted to those spaces between the walled gardens and unifying them. Our customers are telling us in every single way that they can that they don't care about platforms anymore. They care about their experiences. They want their games to cross the platforms, the places, the locations, and the friends that they play those games with. And these walled gardens do nothing but get in the way of that. So for the future, organizations like this and, and our friends at Google and others who are devoted to those open systems are going to have to be in the business of sewing together those walled garden communities and making, for, at least for me, um, the opportunity to metagame across them and to participate in a game wherever I am on whatever device I have. So that's our vision for what we're trying to accomplish. We don't always do the best job of communicating that. I was talking about that earlier with you guys. Um, you know, a lot of what we're doing is really devoted to that task, which is to sewing together those various platforms into one experience. Um, I think that makes us different than a lot of our competitors, but it's, you know, if, if a tiger is its stripes, it is our stripes. We have always been a platform agnostic company from the beginning. We have supported any platform that produces a viable market for us and that our customers support. And in particular, if that platform has something new and interesting to say, we'll support it. So I guess that's kind of where I think we are today. Make any sense? How would I do on time? Oh, pretty good. All right, you wanted to do some Q&A? Is that what I hear? See, I took away your worst company in the world question. Sorry. Is this working? Okay. We got yeah, one over there. Yeah, so uh, question? Let's go. So 
when you talk about platform independence, I really have to ask what your opinion Ag is. Agnostic is probably the right term. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what your opinion is on translation technologies, in particular stuff like Wine for running your Windows apps on Ubuntu. <laughs> yep. So uh, a couple things about translation technologies. Um, first of all, we've been really lucky um, in that uh, we've actually gotten a fair amount of experience with Wine, even though most of you don't know about it. Um, huh? <laughs> what I mean by is that you don't know that EA has actually, we've built, I think, 14 different products for Wine, which none of you have even heard about. So part of the process that we've gone through in working on streaming gaming with Gaikai uh, usually involves the translation of our products to a Wine client for those guys. Um, we're slowly moving away as a part of that process from that, so we're not doing as much of it, but it is something we got a lot of experience with. One of the things we liked about it in that particular uh, uh, circumstance was it's a single configuration. PC is a nightmare for us in that particular way. The diversity of hardware that we have to support and really the diversity of experiences that that creates. Um, but, but we like Wine a lot. Let me tell you about another experience we've had, which is a couple of years ago we took Pogo's Pop It game, which was a Java game that literally was 13 years old or something like that at the time. And we put it through uh, the Google Web Toolkit to turn it into HTML5, and it got faster. I've never had that happen in my whole life. So, uh, you know, I, I think that we have gotten to a level of sophistication in our code bases that that kind of technology, either the Wine methodology, which is to insert something essentially into the EXE or uh, the library set, or that which actually translates code bases to another platform, both look a lot more promising than they've ever looked before. Is that a good answer? All right. Yes, sir. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, one of the questions that came up after it was announced that you were going to be here, that the whole <laughs> internet wants to know, when can I buy games in Ubuntu Software Center at the same time as they're released for other platforms? Uh, a good question. Some of it is an economic decision about how much we hold up releases on other platforms to support you guys. And, and so far, we haven't crossed that line. Um, one of the things that we, have, we are discussing with the Conical is about how to come to a configuration that we can describe that we would realistically support. It's a lot easier for us to say, here is the three graphics cards, the two audio cards, the motherboard, and the CPU specifications we're going to support. If you're not in this box, I'm so sorry, but we can't help you. But here's a piece of code that tells you if you're in the box or not. If we can figure out how to get all of those, those things done and to get to a configuration that all of us kind of agree is the right idea, I think that's how we're going to get there. It's essentially a gaming platform. I've called it an Ubuntu gaming platform. The, the notion of a, essentially a pre-spec expectation of performance. I don't want this to be some rape day, you know, water-cooled. I, I would like it to be a reasonably priced laptop spec, but I'd like to have a GPU. Sorry. I, I can't really go back. Just curious over here. Oh, sorry? If in the future EA would consider releasing some of its older titles open source so that they can be recompiled and built so that they're native to Linux? We have. Um, so SimCity, the original SimCity 1, and I think even a part of the Sims 1 code base have been put in open source, and I have seen some efforts to put it both in Ubuntu and some other Linux formats. So uh, it's kind of happening. We try and get out. Of, I, I try and get our code bases out when we're not using them because I, I think that... Uh, I find it hard to, intel to defend that intellectual property when, we, when there's no particular benefit to us. I'd rather use those resources on things that actually matter. Sorry. I do think there's some stuff that's worth defending. Um, but I, I think in the other cases, usually what happens is when we give you guys access to that, especially when we're about to do new things with it, it just makes the community more interested in what we do. So it's generally a good thing. Yes, sir. Um, have you... Does it work? Yeah. Have you thought about um, actually doing some new games and building them for the native desktop for Linux or for Ubuntu and such games could also link into other platforms or whatever? Have you thought about that at all and how you might do that? Because um, uh, now it looks like Ubuntu is getting into some commercial channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of... Uh, look, I think, I think Ubuntu and the Conical have made a tremendous amount of progress, especially in the last few years. And so I give them a lot of credit for that. One of the other realities that we look at is we expect there's going to be... We expect that our friends in China will eventually pick an operating system that probably won't be made by Microsoft. And, you know, I would believe you guys are in... I believe the products that you guys currently use are in the running. Um, one of the things that we have also looked at in the other platform space is what's going on in the WebGL and HTML5 space. 
What's nice about that, it has a bigger throw than just your community, but we can do some pretty interesting things there. So I hate to plug another conference, but at Google I.O. we have a pretty compelling product offering we're going to show off this year. It's been part of about a three-year effort on our part to see what we can accomplish there. Our goal was to produce essentially PlayStation 2 grade performance in about a $600 laptop browser-based environment. And we think we've gotten there and maybe even a couple of steps beyond. It's taken a lot of development on things like sound systems and game I.O. systems that were new. And we exercised a lot of demons out of Chrome and other and Mozilla's browsers in the process. Usually, we use things in ways that nobody else does. We break them in unbelievable ways. And so um, in all cases, what I think is probably going to come true is that that model is a better distribution model in many ways for the free-to-play market in that it lets us be highly interactive in updating those products. So if I were going to invest specifically in your market today, other than ports coming out of our other space, I would invest in web-based products that really showed off the capacities of the, of the systems that you have. Generally, your stacks are thinner and faster than Microsoft or Apple products. Usually you care more, too. That helps a lot. <coughs> yes, sir. Could you, please, um, could you please tell us about the games from EA that are available in the Ubuntu Software Center as of this week? You know, I should have looked that up, and so I don't know. I'm so... <laughs> but, well, but somebody else knows. Could you um, tell us, like, do you have, like, success metrics for whether you, you consider it to be... That, after which you'll have considered it to have been worthwhile to put it in the Software Center? Yeah, I, I don't think we're at the stage where we're heavily... Um, measuring those products on financial returns. We're more trying to understand what they cost us. So it's, it's, it's what's the development exposure cost to move there, what's the QA cost, which frankly are probably the single largest conversion cost for us in this process today, and then what's the ongoing support cost. And so I think today what we're doing is trying to ship a few things that we can, that we know people are interested in, that will tell us about the rest of those numbers. So it's much less about the revenue per se and understanding What's the size of the community and what's the support profile that they expect? There's a tremendous internal argument before we started to do this on, our, do you guys want more customer service or less? The only thing we know is it won't be the same. So, you know, that's a big variable in that component, probably the single largest one, and that's one of the things we've got to find out. I think some of this, too, is what do we do with web games versus what do we do with, with what I would call native applications. To me, increasingly, from a performance standpoint, only at the extreme edges, it doesn't matter that much anymore. You can do really good things in both cases. I, I, you know, anybody who says they can't make a good game today can't make a good game. It's just you have so many ways to do it. You have so many platforms, so many different ways to reach customers, so many different game models. It's, uh, you know, I just don't buy it if you don't. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Anybody else? Uh, more questions? All right. Well, thanks a lot. It was great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat>
Yeah, it's the Wednesday afternoon blues, isn't it? Sorry. No worries. Yeah, so it's, oh, that's the server clicker. All right, so uh, Wednesday afternoon, I don't know how you feel, but having been to a number of these conferences, I've noticed that there's a particular engagement curve that seems to follow me in my interest. On day one, I start out with a lot of interest and hope and excitement, and on day two, it peaks, it gets to the point where I'm going, wow, look at all these sessions, I wish I could attend every one of them, right? And day three, which is about, right about now, uh, I'm in that valley of exhaustion going, wow, there's just no way. I wish there was some way I could pull this all together. What I'm hoping to do is, I don't know where you find yourself in that particular curve, but if I can get just a few things um, in front of you, bring those to your awareness, and maybe you know, pretend, purport to, to get you moving on that slope of enlightenment, Perhaps when you leave this session, you'll look at some of the software that Intel's making and see if it's of interest, if it's useful to you. We certainly appreciate the community support around it. I think, personally, that that's something that um, is that common ground that I started with, the notion that there's a lot of common ground between what Intel and Canonical and the Ubuntu project and the developers around that in that ecosystem can benefit from. So let me tell you a little bit of what I mean specifically. Um, I'm very interested in building the systems that support a, a, a pretty significant shift in IT underway. It's, it goes by the buzzwords of big data and cloud computing, but if you kind of unpack those terms, there's something very basic and fundamental that's happening. It's that series of interconnected feedback loops between the generation of data by users that drives a kind of computing that requires this amazing elasticity. But in order to use that elasticity, you kind of have to apply a different range of analytic methods and tools that didn't quite work or don't work the same way um, as they do with classic corporate enterprise data, right? So that's sort of the, the set of things. And if I look at what Intel and Canonical have a shared interest in, there are four projects that jump to the surface. Again, speaking as a server-side software guy. It's a KVM, the Linux kernel, OpenStack, and Hadoop. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about every one of these in exhausting detail. Um, what I do want to talk about, though, is the way in which what Intel does in these projects can support you, and if it doesn't, I'd like to know how we can do better at that. That's really the interest here. So when, the way I capture our understanding of how we work within the ecosystem is that there's sort of two arms to this. There's the upstream and the downstream. You've probably all known for quite some time about how Intel works upstream to contribute not just code, but also capital. Intel has a capital arm that invests in a number of open source projects or companies that base their business on open source projects, and that's part of growing the ecosystem and working upstream. The downstream arc, which is where I have a particular interest, is in working with partners such as Canonical to take a lot of these technologies that are enabled upstream and turn them into products and solutions that enterprises, service providers can actually use and deploy. I won't say too much about what Intel's done in the Linux kernel itself because you probably know this well enough. I'm not going to talk too much about what Intel's been doing with KVM either because over the past four or five years, you've seen the various VT star technologies enabled, exposed, and used as hardware-assisted virtualization to drive improvements in KVM as well as Xen. Um, what I do want to focus on is how we work in the context of OpenStack. And I want to start with those enterprises and service providers I mentioned earlier, we start by listening to what they would like to see changed and the technologies that they're getting from vendors today. And the organization, the alliance that we've um, facilitated, um, the Open Data Center Alliance, brings a lot of these vendors 
as well as the customers, the service providers, the cloud consumers um, together. So BMW, Cap, Gemini, um, Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Telekom, these are all enterprises that are members of the Open Data Center Alliance. And by polling them about what it is that prevents or holds them back as they migrate workloads from their traditional enterprise IT data centers to a cloud, we noticed some patterns. And the first one is obvious. That's actually where almost everyone is focused on today in solving the problems related to um, a strategy for migrating the workloads, selecting the workloads that work best in a cloud environment and those that don't. What we're looking ahead to are the number two and three problems, because we figure by the time the community solve problem one, problem two and three will rise to the top of the stack and become interesting. So working with the Open Data Center Alliance, we've created these usage models, or the Open Data Center Alliance has invested in architects and CIOs to develop a usage model that formalizes these requirements. They'd like to know what it is that vendors can do to support that specific set of requirements that come from, so if I pick one in particular, um, the security provider assurance usage model. You could download it, you could look through the requirements. Fundamentally what it says is that there was this level of transparency that was available in enterprise data centers where you could look at the entire set of resources, the hardware, the server, the storage, the networking, and determine whether it was in compliance with regulations, with security, com security regulations or HIPAA standards or whatever else that was normatively established. You can't do that with cloud today. There isn't a simple automated way of figuring out whether a cloud conforms to HIPAA standards or to PCI standards or to any set of regulations that are uh, necessary for a cloud consumer to do business. Right? So in order to support that, particularly within a project such as, say, OpenStack, what we've done is really go back, let me go back to that particular um, phase. What we start with is that having defined those, those problem spaces, we look to enable that solution stack, wherever we may find it. But in the case of um, open source projects, we'd like to see OpenStack as the development vehicle for that set of requirements to be fulfilled. So we, have, we get these requirements from the Open Data Center Alliance. They'd like to see certain standards openly established in cloud operating environments. We've chosen OpenStack as the project in which to deliver some of those reference implementations that can then serve the broader community as you build out these cloud deployments and, and prove them in data centers and proofs of concept. So if I look at OpenStack in particular, and this is you know, a, a, a graphic with thanks to Ken Peppel, um, the, there's a number of components within it, but what we're really looking at is the current state of OpenStack. And I think we can argue on the nuances here, but you'll probably acknowledge that there are gaps between what sort of is the generalized logical structure of a cloud operating environment and what's available today in OpenStack. What we look forward to is being able to see additional requirements come to this notion of a cloud operating environment from the likes of the members of the Open Data Center Alliance. In other words, in order to fulfill the needs of the members, the cloud consumers who are currently in the Open Data Center Alliance, we expect OpenStack and its generalized design of a cloud environment to include elements such as auditing, to include elements such as integration with security information and event monitoring. These are things that ought to be in the roadmap for an OpenStack-based product or solution. And to a large extent, there are current limitations in the technology and in the software stack that prevent that from becoming available today. But Intel's long-term strategic interest is in being able to deliver that, enable that, not just at the silicon level, but also as a reference implementation in the software. And that's sort of the work that the Open Source Technology Center within Intel does. It takes 
a lot of the silicon features that are um, exposed to software vendors and makes them available to the open source communities. So one in particular that we have been very focused on for the past nine months is the notion of a trusted compute pool. And it comes from that ODCA usage model that refers to service provider assurance. And it's the notion that there, are, there ought to be a well-defined zone of resources, compute, storage, networking, that conform to the regulations established by uh, either geographic or policy-driven requirements. And for that to happen, there's a range of things that has to be available from the silicon up through the stack. So if you start with um, a, a, a server as the, the, the basic node, the unit of a cloud, in that server, there has to be a location for um, a measurement of the software stack being launched in order to verify that the, the software, the operating, the hypervisor, the operating system, the virtual machine that was launched conforms to a measured, valid stack that, you, in, other, in other words, to establish that nothing was um, tampered or altered in that basic boot stack. Um, There's a couple of different things that have to happen in addition to that. So you know, in order to prove that the, um, the, the launch components have been measured against a valid stack, you have to be able to, to control where the workloads are provisioned. You have to be able to move the workloads, the VMs, onto particular hosts and not to others. Right? So what I'd like to offer to you is that we've just released a project called Open Attestation that makes available that set of APIs by which, say, Landscape could query um, the, the range of hosts inside an OpenStack deployment that conform to a measured launch. Right? So in other words, you can now use a console or some kind of an API um, set of interfaces to determine whether or not the virtual machines located in hosts conform to a, a state of trust or not. We would extend that. So building on that, what you would go next is with um, notions of power, with notions of thermal or um, quality of service, all of which can then expose um, the service level agreements that a cloud service provider makes available to their customers. I mean, let me try that again. Um, let's assume that a cloud service provider that, pr that offers infrastructure as a service would like to differentiate themselves from their competitors by creating, defining, and meeting SLAs that, that, that specify the trustedness, the power consumption, and the quality of service offered by their hardware resources. And that's what distinguishes them from the next one. In order to do that, they need to have visibility all the way down from the cloud management layer down to the silicon. What we're offering are various open source shim layers between the operating system or the hypervisor and the silicon, as well as between the, the cloud management console and that set of virtual machines or the scheduler to figure out if those VMs and that entire stack conform to that measured launch or not, and that they conform to those differentiated SLAs that the cloud service provider can offer. What this means to an OpenStack community is that if you were, for example, to extend the, we, we are, Intel is working very closely with the um, scheduler, the Nova schedule component in OpenStack, to extend that to be able to pick up on these hardware characteristics that are exposed from the silicon and then to be able to make policy-based decisions on where to locate the virtual machine, where to provision VMs, based on that policy. Okay. I'm going to switch context um, to talk a little bit about Hadoop and how we, we see our investment in that project as well. Um, one of the things that we've noticed in deploying Hadoop, in helping customers deploy Hadoop, 
is that there's a lot of challenges, much as you saw with the OpenStack. We, saw a lot, we see a lot of challenges with just basic deployment, provisioning, configuration, performance tuning related issues. And these issues all stem from the fact that MapReduce is such a complex data flow mechanism that although we've done a fair bit of work over the years in validating the performance of Hadoop clusters um, of various distributions and versions of Hadoop across various generations of the Intel Xeon processor, and we've got measures and we've got white papers you can download to see that, what we really like to get to is a realistic set of workloads in an objective industry standard Hadoop performance benchmark that can then determine how these workloads can be optimized and tuned. Right? So if, if you kind of looked at this particular set of workloads that we've picked, it's a representative sample of Hadoop workloads that we think would, would give us a clear idea of how to tune a Hadoop cluster for, say, machine learning or HDFS. For the moment, a lot of the workloads tend to be I.O. intensive, but as they get more complex, as Hadoop workloads become a lot more analytic in nature, we think that they'll become, that it becomes very important to balance the cluster, that you don't do it just based on um, CPU intensive workloads or IO intensive workloads, and that you have sort of a balance in the storage and the compute nodes that you define for it. Longer term, we'd like to see the performance tuning be more accessible to the operators of Hadoop clusters. So one of the projects that I'd like to make you aware of is HiTune, that um, will probably not get a prize for creative naming, but it's, a, it's an interesting project in that it, re, it uses Hadoop to analyze a Hadoop cluster. So if you have a Hadoop cluster deployed and you've got lots of characteristics coming in um, from those nodes in a Hadoop cluster, we mine that data and determine the performance bottlenecks that prevent optimum performance of Hadoop on that cluster. For example, um, Taobao, which is, which is uh, one of the largest online retailers uh, in the world, perhaps the, one of the top 20 sites on the web, um, had a particular issue that we've been able to address using HiTune where the compression algorithm was causing uh, a performance bottleneck. And by being able to isolate and swap out the compression algorithm to LZO, we were able to see a 2.3x improvement in performance. Th this is a pretty valuable tool when you've got questions around, is my Hadoop cluster working as well as it should? Um, and how do I know where to tweak the, tweak the controls? So again, both open attestation, SDK, and HiTune are available on GitHub. You could download it today, and you could start to play with it. HiBench is that collection of workloads that we're working um, to release to open source as well. So if that's an interest to you, let me know, and I'd be happy to help you with that. Um, I've been told to let you know that there is a prize waiting. If you do sign up for, um, uh, to, to write a success story based on the work that you've been doing, that Intel can help publish or, or rebroadcast, it's something that uh, we're happy to, to support you with. And if you want to fill out a card and drop it in the in the, uh, the enter, enter for a drawing um, on Friday afternoon, we have an SSD that uh, you might be able to claim, take home. Yeah. All right, thank you all for your time and attention. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Thanks.